Um, I'm uh, Jean-Louis Landry. I'm an Obama scholar at uh, Columbia University. I'm also, my background's in, in open data. I've, I've been active in the open data community for more than, uh, more than a decade. Uh, and I used to lead an organization called Open North, which was the uh, leading nonprofit organization in Canada uh, on, uh, on open data and civic technology. And for today, uh, we're going to be talking about community-driven extreme weather preparedness planning in northern Manhattan, and this is really intended to be a, a conversation from different types of perspectives, so from different sectors, um, around data, information, and resource needs. And um, I've had the privilege uh, of being able to, uh, to volunteer with uh, WE Act for Environmental Justice uh, here in Harlem, where I'm living. Um, and uh, learning a lot about um, you know, the types of issues, but also the ways that they've been mobilizing uh, community uh, residents uh, in their preparedness uh, plan on climate action. And um, the idea came from just my involvement through, uh, through WE Act and knowing the open data community and wanting to be able to kind of facilitate a conversation from different perspectives. Um, we've got uh, three of our uh, five speakers. Uh, fourth one is expected to, to be joining shortly. Um, first off, uh, we'll be hearing from uh, Annie uh, Carfor Carfor Foro, sorry, from the Climate Justice Organizer at, uh, at We Act for Environment Environmental Justice. Um, then we'll hear from uh, Andrew uh, Kukeski, sorry, I'm killing the names here, <laughs> uh, who's a senior staff associate at uh, the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at Columbia University. Um, and we'll be hearing also from Eunice Ko, uh, Deputy Chief of Staff and Senior Policy Advisor for Equity at the New York City uh, Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, and uh, as soon as uh, Mark, Le uh, Mark Levine, borough president from uh, Manhattan, joins us, uh, we'll also be hearing from, uh, from him as well. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, Adrian wasn't able to, to make it. But that's okay. I think we've got an hour. Uh, so let's jump right in. The, uh, we're going to hear first from, uh, from Annie to tell us about the WE Act uh, kind of project that they've been uh, leading in the community. Uh, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Andrew, then Eunice, and then if uh, if Mark joins, then we'll also be hearing from him. So over to you, Annie. Great, thank you so much, Jean Noé. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today, and thank you, Jean Noé, for organizing this and coordinating all of this. Uh, my name is Annie, and as Jean Noé said, I'm the climate justice organizer. At we act for environmental justice. Uh, we're a 34 year old community based nonprofit working in northern Manhattan. Um, and our work is all based in environmental justice. We empower and organize low-income residents and people of color to build healthy communities by participating in the creation of sound and fair environmental health uh, policies and practices. Um, so, you know, we've become real local and, and national leaders in the field of advocating for environmental justice policy change, but um, are very committed to our local roots of Northern Manhattan. Um, and so since 2015, really, our community has risen the issue of emergency preparedness as um, we are starting to see the advancing effects of climate change and um, how those effects are disproportionately impacting poor and working class communities. Um, but after the summer of 2021, there was really a renewed sense of urgency to engage in community level preparedness planning, um, specifically around flooding and extreme heat which were the two climate related extreme weather events that impacted Northern Manhattan the most and were especially prevalent this past summer. Um, we Act has a lot of experience organizing around and preparing for extreme heat. Um, we know that temperatures are getting hotter for longer periods of time. We know that neighborhoods in Northern Manhattan and areas of the South Bronx are disproportionately hotter than other um, parts of the city. Um, and that you know our neighborhoods lack key investments that can keep um, neighborhoods cool and have a disproportionate load of bus depots, parking lots, highways, et cetera. Um, but the flooding that Northern Manhattan experienced between Tropical Storm Elsa this summer, Hurricane Ida, um, and a couple, you know, one-off thunderstorms that just, you know, released an extreme amount of rain of uh, like cloudburst type rain, um, were really frightening to a lot of our community. And people felt really unprepared, um, especially when they saw, you know, common street corners like 125th in Amsterdam or the one train at 157th Street completely flooded. Um, and so this got we act kind of thinking, um, you know, people, there's data out there um, that can warn people about their increased flood risk. The city has a really robust data, um, 
set of data that exists, um, you know, especially the, the most recent stormwater runoff map is very accurate to reflecting kind of areas that flooded this summer due to extreme rain. Um, and for heat, it's similar. There's so many, you know, data sets out there that can help you understand tree cover and, and heat vulnerability and where to find cooling centers, et cetera. But there's a disconnect between what we were noticing talking to community members is there's a disconnect between the data that the city's putting out there for our consumption and our community's ability to interpret and plan accordingly. Um, so this kind of kicked off our community-led planning, planning process um, that has created our, our new plan that we're calling the Climate Ready Uptown Plan. Um, and this came out of WEACT's Climate Justice Working Group, which is comprised of members of WEACT um, that live in Northern Manhattan and beyond and are fighting for climate justice in environmental justice communities. Um, so our planning process involved like a number of different components because we really wanted to make sure we were receiving like extensive public input and that we were also making this plan for the people who live in Northern Manhattan who are not necessarily data experts or emergency preparedness experts. Um, so we had our um, subcommittee within our climate justice working group that was helping us on this emergency planning. And they were really the backbone of the plan. They're community members, they're researchers, they're experts in the field, and they're also, you know, um, longtime residents. And they helped with research, coming up with common definitions and common language to use within the plan, um, the design of the tool. They've also helped outreach and facilitate broader public meeting with, um, with North Northern Manhattan residents. We also engaged local emergency preparedness organizations, two specifically being the East Harlem Co-Ad, um, which formed after Hurricane Sandy, um, when they felt that their community was really getting left behind in recovery efforts, um, as well as the Harlem Emergency Network that also formed after Hurricane Sandy and created a really, a very robust communication network for emergencies that involves radio, updated social media, handheld walkie talkies, really anything but, and also cell phones. Um, so both of these organizations have long um, roots in the community and is specifically in emergency preparedness um, along with WEAC's you know, uh, roots in the community. Um, we also held public planning meeting with the larger North, Northern Manhattan um, constituency. We involved community boards in that, elected officials offices, and we ran through scenarios of extreme heat and flooding to get feedback on how Northern Manhattan residents respond to these issues and what data or what information they wish they had or would have if this issue, if this scenario was to occur. Um, we consulted experts at Columbia, who I see some are on this call, so very happy that they're there, they're here. Um, and then we're also, as we move into the design phase of the actual booklet, we're um, creating a focus group of seven to eight Manhattan residents that really represent the diversity of Manhattan and can give granular feedback on how maps are portrayed how um, how easy or difficult the data is to understand and how the content looks and is is digested. Um, so just through all of these different like groups and different um, kind of stakeholders, we found some like really acute challenges to informing communities specifically about flood risk um, because flood maps are changing so quickly and have changed dramatically since Hurricane Sandy. Many people are not up to date on if they are in a flood zone, um, if their emergency shelter has changed. Um, and another really interesting thing that came out of these conversations is that there is a large constituency of Northern Manhattan that are not um, reliably connected to the internet. And so having physical copies of things is so critical for people in a way that is also readable for them to, to uh, relate to their own individual risk. Um, and another really interesting um, piece of feedback that we got from the, these, the public meetings is that there's a lot of additional data that people are looking for when they think about these emergencies. Um, this can include charging stations, um, emergency shelters, flood risk of subways and bus lanes, um, publicly owned facilities, and also just community resources, informal networks and data. Um, and so we're kind of right now in the compiling stage where we're putting all of this feedback that we've gotten from people in all of the open data that exists in the city and figuring out how can we put this in a way that again is digestible and relatable for somebody to understand their individual risk. Um, but I wanna just mention a couple of key takeaways before I pass it on to our next speaker is that um, from this planning process, we know that much of the data that communities need to prepare themselves for climate change exists. 
Um, but the challenge lies in really presenting that data to somebody who is not comfortable with data sets in a digestible way that is also relevant to them and relevant to their personal lives. Um, we also know that community-based organizations that have long-standing relationships with the community should be key players in disseminating this information um, because they're trusted figures. And, and when we, you know, we're talking to people, they, um, they, they know that the information that's coming from us is reliable and something that they can, can and want to interact with. And then finally, building out community networks um, that can provide services and resources in an emergency are really critical pieces of informal data that can improve a community's resilience. And this is something that we're spending a lot of time working on with Harlem Emergency Network to map local businesses, organizations, soup kitchens, churches that have resources and can mobilize in an emergency situation um, so that people know, you know, this data that might not exist in a formal data set on open, da open data, but can be really useful for, for community members um, alike. So that's a little bit about our plan. And I'm sure when we get into the discussion, I'm happy to answer more questions, but um, I want to pass it back to John Noe and, and thank you all for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I think you've really kind of laid the uh, the ground for uh, a great discussion and, you know, uh, a really kind of commendable uh, initiative by We Act that helps us uh, look at open data from a context driven and community led uh, initiative. And that's that's really what we wanted to focus on today. So I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, Andrew. Um, who will be able to uh, speak to us um, more from the, the climate uh, science perspective, uh, given his specialization in remote sensing and mapping of atmospheric and meteorological uh, variables. Uh, so over to you, Andrew. Thanks, John Noe, and thanks, and thanks, Annie. Yes, so as John Noe said, I'm Andrew Kruchkevich. I'm a meteorologist by background from the New York area, and I lived in Brook I've been living in Brooklyn, different parts of Brooklyn for the past 15 years. Um, and I want to start to start off what, uh, my my part of this is yeah sharing a, a rather a, a shocking story or a story I was surprised to hear and yeah it happened after the September floods that were mentioned already in the session um, and I remember hearing stories about well from people that were impacted by the devastating flash floods in different parts of the city and they basically were saying well some were saying. I can't believe I have to deal with this again. You know, I lived through this in Sandy and I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do. We wanted to get out of the flood zone. You know, we looked at the flood maps and we moved to central Queens or so Eastern Queens or central Brooklyn. You know, we thought we did what was right. Why is this happening? You know, why do I have to go through this when my part, my apartments flooded? Why do I have to go through this when I feel like my life, my my life, my life is in danger. My family's lives could be in danger. This is not. It's not fair. Why can't we trust the data that's available? You know, we're trying to do the right thing. You tell us after Sandy, we're going to see more floods. Why are we having floods in areas where we don't expect them? And that story really sticks with me, and I think it's it's important as us. If, let's say speaking from my perspective as a scientist, a, meteorologi a meteorologist and climate scientist who operates at the interface of science and society. You know, I think we have a responsibility to do better. I think we're in a very privileged position. And I think we need to be more aware, you know, of these accountability structures. And when we tell people to know their risk, what does that mean? What is the uncertainty? What are the limitations? What are the expectations? And right now the incentive structure for the scientists is not there. You know, the, the incentive structure is around getting out data, getting out maps, telling people where things might happen and not necessarily talking about um, the challenges and the forecast and the limitations. So I want to start off by saying that because I think we need to focus a little bit more on that, especially in the coming years when we're going to see more floods. We're going to see more floods in places that have not seen floods before. And most specifically, we're going to see floods impacting traditionally underserved communities even more than they do now, even more. So just starting off with that, uh, and I wanted to tie it back also back to, to Sandy. So I mentioned this, this, I think, connection or relationship between what happened in August and September this year. So what happened in the summer and September this year and Sandy? What are some of the similarities and differences and why does it matter? 
Well, we can start off with the differences. Well, they happened in different times of the year, different months rather, um, different types of storms, you know, some similarities with the types of storms, but Sandy was also forecast, you know, to, to, to lead to some types of impact. I mean, so to some extent, the floods were forecast as well, just on a different lead time. Um, but the type of flood was very different. You know, with Sandy, we saw storm surge flooding. So the rise and push of the ocean onto land in certain areas. And in the summer and into September this year, we saw it flooding from intense rainfall. So flooding in areas that were quite distant from the shoreline in some cases. In some areas where we, we, have, we, we have known locations of improper drainage or just areas that where the drains, the drainage system cannot hand, handle the heavy rainfall. In my neighborhood in Gowanus, Brooklyn, for example, we, were, we had feet of water in the street. Um, so yeah, but that was some of the main differences in the main similarities there, but both were floods. And I think that is one of the important factors here. Um, these are types of floods. Uh, when people think of their flood risk, what is our responsibility as scientists to, to be aware that there are challenges in talking about different types of floods in where different types of floods might happen and also the different ways to forecast floods. I mean, I have, uh, I, I, I have a phone just like I'm sure everyone else does, a phone that's capable of, of receiving the push notifications when we have a flash flood warning. And I'll be the first to say that there's times when that phone goes off and, and not only do most people not do anything, including me, but like, what would you do? How would you, how are you supposed to deviate from what you would do that day or that minute? They seem very urgent and they seem very shocking. And I think this is also something that happened in the summer and September of this past year, where there was an acknowledgement of distributing warnings, but in terms of linking those warnings into action and understanding the opportunity cost for populations to deviate from what they would normally do, actually takes a lot of a responsibility on the, on the part of the disseminator. Uh, and I think this ties back into what Annie was saying also about there is a lot of data available. You know, and there's ways to 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 share that, you know, and to to do so in a way that it, that it should motivate change. But yeah, there's other issues at play here. It's not necessarily the forecast's uh, fault or error. Um, there is a, a very a growing need to have people that could that could tailor that data, could interpret that data, integrate that data into actions that could actually happen within communities. You know, within understanding what actions that those communities can take, they should take. And then figuring out how to prioritize and messaging to prioritize ties those actions specifically, not just warning, but moving from forecasts to warning into action. And it's really not easy. It really in involves understanding the, 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 let's say, accountability that goes into issuing warnings, but also understanding the accountability of deprioritization. You know, and that's something that uh, from some of my work, um, working with the humanitarian community, in other countries as well, thinking about what does it mean to warn people in one county, in one neighborhood, and not warn people in the neighboring county or in the other neighboring community? What does it mean to take certain actions? How do we draw these lines? Many times the forecasts that we use for rainfall, for flooding, they are not produced at the granularity that people perceive them to be produced at. You know, sometimes we're not necessarily able to give street by street forecasts. Therefore, it could be inappropriate to deprioritize some areas and prioritize others. And that's okay. I think another key message of my, of my talk is there's limitations in forecasts. You know, th there needs to be a greater acknowledgement that they're not perfect. They're not supposed to be perfect. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should never blame the scientists. I think there are times when the forecast is wrong and the scientist is also, is also wrong. But many times I feel this is more about that, that transmission pathway from the forecast to the dissemination to saying things, making statements from this trusted position as a scientist, as a meteorologist. That's where I think a lot of the, a lot of the um, challenges lie rather than in the data itself. So we're here now, I feel like there are significant gaps between availability and use, but we need to break that down more. And we need to do it from a community perspective. I think there's, there's, there's opportunities here um, in Northern Manhattan, for example, there's opportunities now to understand what those gaps are between availability and use. What are the data gaps? Perhaps the data gap could potentially be, and likely, I would say, not the biggest gap. 
But how do we integrate those forecasts? How do we understand what actions can, can be taken? How do we fund those actions? You know, and then how do we monitor um, if we are leading to a decreased disproportionality of impact on underserved communities? Because there's also a risk at times where we're not necessarily doing that. And I think we need to be more aware of that as well. Um, the last thing, I think there's a couple more minutes left, um, but just about, yeah, the, the, the idea of just the cost of doing nothing and the cost of doing something. I guess we could leave it off there. Yes, like I would love for, to be more specific with forecasts and forecasts are getting better, but we need to understand that this is, exists ac across a continuum, the costs and benefits of forecasts and taking action. There are costs of doing nothing, but there's all, also costs of doing something if we do so in a haphazard way without understanding the disproportionalities of impact that occur across our communities in New York City. Um, and, we, and we have seen that and we will continue to see that. So I think that I'll leave it there for now. Um, I feel like there are definitely New York City's at the forefront at a lot of this work. I should also say, like I'm very proud to, to live here and, and see work moving forward in, in activities and people acknowledging this, that is the first step. Um, but there are various opportunities for Northern Manhattan to learn from the other parts of New York City, which I think is also something to note. Um, but yeah, I think that overarching point of mine is there is a lot of data available. As, as my career progresses, I find myself producing a lot less data and acting more at the interface of science policy and practice in order to make sure the data that is produced is used appropriately, is used effectively, and used to actually decrease that disproportionality of impact for disasters. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, back over to you, jean -Louis. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrew. And I think you, both of you, both Annie and yourself, have touched on the role of intermediaries in, in many ways of how to translate and make, uh, you know, an effective use of, of data. So it's a, an interesting piece of the, the open data puzzle if we're not dealing necessarily with the availability of data, but actually how to, how to use it well. Um, so I think you also segue really well to, uh, to our next speaker, uh, Eunice uh, Ko from uh, the, the mayor's office of uh, climate and environmental justice. So over to you. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, like uh, Gino already said, my name is Eunice Ko. I work at the newly minted mayor's office of climate and environmental justice, uh, which now integrates both sustainability and resiliency into one office and uh, a coordinated approach. Uh, where we're going to work to make our buildings efficient and resilient, our infrastructure climate ready, and our public realm as living streets and open spaces, and finally, our energy clean and resilient. So I will, of course, then be speaking from the city of perspective, uh, sorry, from the perspective of the city of New York and how we use data and the types of data uh, we collect to better understand climate risks that people face across the city and in their neighborhoods and really enables different stakeholders in the city to understand, plan, and prepare for these climate risks. Um, and to Annie's point, uh, we know uh, the way we collect and produce data can certainly be improved to ensure we are thinking about quality of life impacts from climate change and really hearing from people on the ground um, so that we are protecting and prioritizing the, mo the communities most vulnerable to climate change. So I'm gonna break it down the kind of uh, the different data types and how we use data in the two different risks that we are talking about. So first, uh, extreme heat. So in extreme heat, uh, we use our data to prioritize investments and resources in communities that are made most vulnerable to extreme heat. So for example, our Be A Buddy, our faith-based outreach, our tree planting initiatives, all prioritize investments and resources in communities that are made most vulnerable to extreme heat as indicated by this data tool, the Heat Vulnerability Index. So the Heat Vulnerability Index, for those of you who don't know, uh, uses a statistical model to summarize the most important social and environmental factors that contribute to neighborhood heat risk. So the resulting map shows neighborhoods whose residents are more at risk for dying during and immediately following extreme heat. The factors included in the HVI are surface temperature, green space, access to home air conditioning, and the percentage of residents who are low income or non-Latin Black. So unlike many social vulnerability indices, the HVI is actually validated against NYC mortality data, meaning that neighborhoods with elevated risk identified by the index are those areas with elevated heat exacerbated deaths during extreme heat events. 
Separately, for the past several years, our office in partnership with DOHMH and the Parks Department has run a temperature monitoring campaign, um, which collects real time temperature data in high heat vulnerable neighborhoods to better understand the hyper local temperature difference differences between community and the factors I kind of already listed open space impervious services, building orientation, etc. Um, that are the primary driving factors to the urban heat island effect. So the findings have been developed into a really cool data story and published on open data and really helped to inform the city's heat resiliency strategy. Um, for another example, the Be a Buddy program, which again uses the HVI to prioritize um, investments. This is a social resiliency program that was piloted in three neighborhoods with the highest level of heat vulnerability. So this is how we're using the HVI. Um, so the goal here for the program is to identify and regularly engage with climate vulnerable residents through hyper local volunteer buddy networks. And these networks can then be activated during extreme heat and other emergencies such as COVID. Across the three Be a Buddy programs we have stood up, CBO staff and volunteers have identified over a thousand climate susceptible residents and recruited 66, 66 local volunteers. 70% of the residents are over 55. 65% live in subsidized housing, and a majority are Black and Latina women. Um, and during early COVID activation, from about March to May 2020, over 4,000 contacts were made, um, representing success rates of 92%, which is just picking up the call. Um, so that's some of the data, again, that we collect and, again, use, actually, in how we prioritize our investments and um, focus our programming funding um, in the city to address uh, heat risks. On the inland flooding side, which we're referencing here as flash flooding, which is due to extreme precipitation, as we all mentioned, um, cloudburst uh, effect, as Annie pointed out, um, we have a few things that we're trying to do here. I think that the key signature um, data initiative um, that we're working on is called FloodNet. FloodNet is really an innovative flood data collection program that provides real-time street-level flood information to New York City government agencies, local residents, emergency response teams, and researchers. FloodNet began in 2020 as a grant-funded pilot project in two areas of the city, Gowanus and parts of Jamaica Bay, and is a partnership um, between our office, the mayor's office of the chief technology office, city agencies, NYU Tandon Center for Urban Science and Progress, CUNY Advanced Science Research Center, and the Science and Resilience Institute of Jamaica Bay. So this is a multi-partnership um, collaboration. And the, the pilot flood net sensors recorded flash floods in Gowanus in real time and with high resolution during both Tropical Storm Henri and Hurricane Ida, and has recorded high tide flooding in Jamaica Bay neighborhoods regularly. So after the flooding from Hurricane Ida, which has been referenced a few times in this conversation, the city really committed to expanding the uh, sensor network citywide over the next five years by installing up to 500 new sensors in 50 priority areas to be determined by analysis of stormwater risk, tidal flooding risk, storm damages, environmental justice history, social vulnerability, critical infrastructure, and proximity to wireless network connections. And the flood sensor data has multiple uses, um, including one, informing potential road closures or travel plans and alerting drivers to avoid flooded and dangerous streets. Two, alerting communities to the need of emergency preparedness and response, including activating real-time mitigation measures like sandbags and removal of valuables from basements. Three, being used to help identify areas um, that most ur are most urgently in need of post-storm um, assistance. Fourth, validating existing storm, uh, sorry, validating existing flood models, for example, like the storm model, uh, stormwater model, as well as future flood models, and better honing in flood flooding predictions. And lastly, informing stormwater and tidal flooding resiliency planning. Uh, we recently um, deployed some sensors in the Bronx. So we installed four sensors in the Bronx in February, um, Westchester and Colgate, Sheridan 173rd, 169th and Intervale, Southern and Freeman, as well as one gateway at the Bronx River House um, in Startlight Park. So we're working with Alicia Grion in the North Bronx Collective to deploy additional sensors south of Van Cortland Park based on the flooding they've seen in the area. CUNY students are also involved as well as community members and they're all invited to the, to the deployments to learn more about the sensor technology and gain installation experience. So we will eventually do a concurrent uh, community outreach process to identify high impact flooding locations, explain sensor functions and uses, collect and communicate uh, community feedback, 
produce educational uh, materials, and really train residents on flood uh, net dashboard and methods of rep uh, reporting flooding and its impacts. Um, you know, I think the stretch really here um, for our office um, is really to think about and how to collect and use qualitative data for policy making, decision making, and strategic planning. Um, you know, how are we um, enabling and including um, community members' voices to actually tell us what the risks are that they face and how they even define and view risk? Um, so again, yeah, more about quality of life impacts to, to climate change and better understanding what those are um, and being told by communities what those are and really thinking about then how we are um, creating our interventions, making our decisions, and again, prioritizing our investments in the city to protect those who are most vulnerable to, to climate change. Um, so those are just a few ways of the um, types of data, again, we collect and the ways we as city government try to use um, data, but also publish data so that, you know, myriad of sectors and stakeholders are able to then use that data to help inform, prepare, and plan for um, climate risks in the city. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, if you don't mind sharing maybe links to some of the initiatives that you named uh, in your in your remarks, that would be great just for the benefit of uh, everybody who's uh, listening in today. Um, and so our, our last speaker here, who I, I saw join us a little bit earlier, um, if he wants to put on, uh, to put on his, uh, his camera. There you go. Uh, <laughs> Borough President Levine, nice to see you. Nice to have you with us. Um, so this is a, it's great to be able to have the perspective of a, an elected official uh, in the region that we're discussing today around uh, community preparedness uh, for these types of uh, weather events. Um, and so I'll, I'll turn it over to you for, for your remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, jean Noy. This has been a, an incredibly enlightening panel. I have learned so much. I am definitely the least expert person here. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, overstate my credentials, but um, I'm just thrilled that that Open Data Week is now making a space for climate, for resiliency, and and for extreme weather preparedness because Manhattan uh, is, after all, a very small island, not that far from the Atlantic, that uh, has been proven over the past decade to be incredibly vulnerable to extreme weather, and uh, we're we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of Sandy uh, with very little to show for it. Very little of our coastline is any better protected than it was 10 years ago. And as I think Andrew pointed out, the threat now, now comes uh, as likely from above as from the sea. Um, the community where we act was built in West Harlem is hundreds of feet, I think 200 feet above sea level at 145th Street and flooded terribly uh, in some of the summer storms. So uh, if, if West Harlem is vulnerable to flooding, then, then everywhere in this city certainly is. Uh, we're celebrating a decade since uh, a landmark law really cracked open data in New York City by making it more accessible to the public. And it, it's been a decade that really showed uh, all the impact that, that making data open to the public can have. I, I really believe there's there's no aspect of life here that can't be where we can't make better policy if we have open data. But I think that environmental policy is probably the least explored field. Um, it's more common that open data is being used on transportation and sanitation, housing issues and other matters, but we're really behind on using it as a tool for resiliency and for um, environmental policy more broadly. So there's huge potential here. Um, for policymakers uh, like myself, for activists like many of you, um, and, and ultimately for the public. And it does seem like extreme weather is, is uh, a good use case of data for, for all of those reasons. Uh, so as policymakers, we can track it. So activists who are fighting for investments have that data, but also so the public uh, is, is adequately warned. Um, I think that, that, that my role in this debate more broadly is going to be serving as your ally and pushing for the right data to be collected, for it to be made available and be made available in a way that, that's easy to process. Uh, and, and that will allow all of you as experts and activists to, to do your job in fighting for good policy. Um, we, we've seen a pattern of compliance often with open data laws that adheres to the letter but um, 
often doesn't in fact produce useful data. A common technique is to release massive data sets in the form of a PDF. Uh, this, this, is, this just happened with, with the MTA. I'm fighting for uh, screen doors on subway platforms and uh, they released a 4,000 page PDF in response. And we got our great friends at, at Beta NYC who I think are on here, uh, who are just you know, obviously leaders in this movement to, uh, to scrape it. So uh, MTA didn't stop us, but it, it shouldn't take having experts at Beta NYC to analyze data. Anyone in New York City should be able to do it. And so I think, I think that, that elected officials who are your allies really can fight to make sure that um, the data that's collected on some of uh, really thrilling to hear from Eunice, um, the new data that's going to be coming in. I wasn't aware of that. Um, but we have to make sure that it's available to all of you in a way that's timely and accessible and uh, that you don't need a doctorate in data science to, to understand. So uh, I consider this probably the beginning of, 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 um, of really an intense period of work to uh, collect, to collate, to post, and then make policy based on data for resiliency and, and the environment more broadly. Really um, proud that you're, you're focusing on Uptown and Manhattan, which is so vulnerable. Uh, and just look forward to being a partner with you in this work uh, in the months and years to come. Thank you so much for having me as part of this discussion. Thank you very much. Um, much appreciated. Um, also, as a uh, as a data consumer yourself, in terms of your your work and, and your mandate uh, in the function that you you serve uh, in the uh, in the community. Um, so I now we we're getting a couple of questions that uh, in in the chat, but I also want to give the opportunity for the panelists themselves if they want to kind of comment on what's been said by uh, by each other. Um, so this would be a point if uh, if anybody wants to kind of react to uh, to what's been said uh, so far. Uh, and otherwise, I've got I've got questions too. So I'm not sure Andrew, Eunice, uh, or Annie, if you want to uh, comment on what's already been said. Let's go with Andrew, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks again, Jean Noé, for this, for the discussion. I'm trying to think of a way to phrase this question. And perhaps this is not going to be the best way to phrase it. I hate to start it off with that, but trying to think of it to frame this around a narrative. And it were, I guess the thing I'm thinking of is this. My, my younger sister works at Memorial Sloan Kettering, the hospital there. And she deal and she's she's a nurse there. And in many ways, her role is to act as the kind of interpreter, tailor, tailor of data between patient and doctor and also doctor and patient. And it makes me think of a, of a story that she told me once before when she was like, yeah, like someone once said, like, why is it so difficult to read the CAT scans or CT scans? Shouldn't they be easy to read? And it's like, well, like, this is something that like doctors are like, they could be easily misinterpreted. They're complex representations of risk, really. They're images and you could identify some, they tell stories that, you know, should be someone that has some skill set to interpret that. And it makes me think a lot about climate data and, and disaster risk data as well. On one hand, it's great to have data open and available. I think we need to do that. However, I don't necessarily think it all needs to be easily access, easy, easy, easy to understand. I think it needs to be appropriately easy to understand. If something is extremely complex and there's different types of flood risk kind of interacting and compounding in some areas, like that might be, it might be impossible <clears throat> and inappropriate, I think, to represent in a simplified way. So I think that's just for the discussion here. I think that like, I guess my, to be provocative somewhat, I don't necessarily think all climate risk data needs to be simple to understand. I think there's times where you need, oh, sorry, different types of experts to say, well, if you're thinking of a flood disaster, what are the complex, let's say, let's say race and gender aspects that lead to some areas be at increased risk of a disaster? What are the complex climate factors that lead to some areas to be at increased risk of a disaster? And that stuff, I find it's very, sometimes when you oversimplify it, it could be interpreted in a different way. So just stating that for the group, interested in, in hearing other people's thoughts on that. 
Anybody want to react? I mean, to me, that makes me think of, because you're talking about different types of experts, which also requires, you know, we're talking from um, making your data available and then not just usable, but easily understandable. Um, and that takes, you know, different perspectives, but also different sectors to be able to kind of collaborate together. And different sectors will have different time scales, different objectives, different interests, you know, so that's the kind of the, the bringing together of different parties to collaborate that, you know, may not align you know, as as effectively as we would assume, even if there's you know a common cause to interpret the data uh, well. So I, I I just wanted to kind of mention that that's something that we've been looking at as well at the climate school while I'm here. So I see another um, a hand that's been raised. So uh, Joanna, if you want to uh, ask your question, so over to you. Hi everyone. Uh, hi. Oh, did I just speak over someone? I hope I didn't. No, I wasn't sure who was your first. So you'll have it first and then we'll sure, go to sure. the next. Uh, I'll go quickly. Um, it's good to see everyone here. Um, lots of familiar faces. Thank you all for such like wise and interesting remarks. I guess my questions for Andrew, some of your reflections and that story you told about, um, like you told us to leave these places after Hurricane Sandy and now I find myself somewhere else where you said it was going to be less risky. And I think that raises such important points both about setting expectations about what data tells us and about um, being clear and appropriately framing what uncertainty means as it relates to projections and predictions. And I think, at, you know, as a moment of reflection, 10 years out of Sandy, I think you're also pointing to like a real failing of engagement um, and of methods and process in planning and design and in articulating and co-understanding what we mean by risk and vulnerability in, in New York. And I think your remarks offer like a point of reflection on that. So I'm curious, um, you know, in your mind and in your experience, like what change in process or method or vehicle is needed to get better at making some of this translation. Um, you know, we often have this kind of like more data is more better. And I think what you're saying is not necessarily. Um, so I'm just curious in your mind, like when you think about the engagement piece, what to you is, does success look like in, in, that, in that regard? Well, I'm glad to comment and, and really want to hear from everyone else as yeah, well. And of I course. I'll actually start from echoing what Eunice is saying about, in, about not only engaging the community. I mean, there's a lot of talk about community engagement and stakeholder engagement, getting people at the table, but there's different ways to do that, of course. And like understanding who are the people that are trusted in the community. It sounds like, Eunice, in your example, you're finding those people. Uh, I mean, I call on, most of my experience is, in, is international, working with different humanitarian organizations. And the experience I recall is working in the, the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, where I was asked to support some prioritization of early warning action there. And yeah, it, it, it really didn't matter where the information was coming from. Uh, what the most vulnerable sub camps within the larger camp, million people in this camp, the sub camps would say, listen, we're trusting the local religious leaders, the Maji leaders. These are the people that need to understand. These are the people that need to do the translation. We don't all have to know everything about the data set, but these people should. We will listen to them. Will we listen to the UN? Maybe. Will we listen to the Bangladeshi government? Maybe. When we listen to, the, to these trusted people in our camps, yes. And it also reminds me of, of during Sandy. I mean, during Sandy, uh, after, after Sandy in the Rockaways, um, <clears throat> just having some, some contacts and friends down there asking why people left and why people didn't like. Well, with Sandy, we should also say the year before what happened, we had, her, we had tropical storm Irene and many people interpreted that as something that would lead to very high impact and they perceived it as a miss. Now, I actually don't think it's a miss because what does a miss mean? Kind of points fingers at the forecast. And I mean, the situation didn't lead to the impact expected is the best way to say it, I think. But with Sandy, the people that did leave would say, they're like, well, you know what? We left when the surfers and the fishermen told us to leave, you know? And so like, who are like, understanding there's a big difference between stakeholder engagement, community engagement, you know, and actually taking the time to understand who these people are. And I don't think they're scientists. I think most there's a disincentive for scientists to engage substantively. 
is it, there's a disincentive in the university structure for us to engage in this work, honestly. I don't get credit for doing this, you know, I'm supposed to write papers and teach. So I think like understanding who are the people, who are the right trusted people, the right type of trust, uh, I think is a, is a first step. But I, I really want to hear more from Eunice and, and Annie and anyone else on that as well. Eunice, do you want to jump in? And then we'll, we've got a question also from Sally, but I do want to hear from the other panelists on that topic. I, I'm seeing some head nodding, so over, over to you. Yeah, I think maybe, you know, the, the bridge to, to data and motivating behavior and I guess changing behavior, I feel like is, is translating risks to ways people care and understand their lives and their like their day to day. So their kids going to school, having access to clean air and water, being able to go to church every Sunday if that's what you do. Um, and really just like understanding how climate risk will just impact people's ability to do those things and ultimately impact like what they value and how they like live their lives, I think is ultimately what will motivate people to, to act to act and different types of people, right? We're talking about engaging houses of worship and doing a climate week where houses of worship are, you know, talking about climate change and the climate risks in neighborhoods. You're now reaching a different group of people. If we're doing that in our schools, if we're doing that, um, I don't know, with our healthcare workers, um, you start motivating different people based on what they care about. And I think that's truly like, I think it is a translation of data, the way we see data and open data is not necessarily resonates with, you know, what that means for me getting my groceries or having access to food um, on a regular basis. So uh, I think that's like the missing piece here. And that's, again, we need communities and people to be able to uh, like fill in that gap. Yeah, that's great. Um, Annie, did you want to maybe comment on, on that topic around uh, kind of the the trust and, you know, different types of individuals, you know, that have that trust within a community that you've encountered maybe through uh, We Act's work? Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of what's being said here and just like helping people understand how it relates to them. I know something that we're looking at in our plan is like making our map interactive so people can mark where they live, where they take their kids to school, their nearest hospital, and they can understand kind of in their day to day how flood or heat could impact their, their lives. Um, I also think that something that was interesting that came out of our community meeting is that um, one of the biggest resources people mentioned when talking about preparedness were their neighbors in their building and making sure that they had connections with their neighbors and contact information and they knew who their vulnerable neighbors were um, and that they had meetings to talk about preparedness, um, which is kind of getting to Andrew's point that not everybody needs to be able to understand this data, but that there needs to be this, you know, informal network of support out there. That is, you know, what the Be A Buddy program really gets to at the heart and is a really excellent and successful program. And so, um, you know, I think we really are looking for those like unofficial or informal networks that can can really improve and strengthen a community's resiliency. Um, and, and one other thing, I would be doing a disservice to our partners at East Harlem Co-ed if I didn't mention this, but I do um, agree with Borough President Levine that I think our elected officials have been very reactive instead of proactive when it comes to emergency preparedness. And there's so much data out there and it can only do so much for you if it's if, you know, there's a one in 100 year flood. Um, and, you know, emergency preparedness in communities, especially in this time of, you know, rapidly change, um, advance, you know, we're seeing the effects of climate change at a rapid clip. It, it really needs to be baked into everything. It's an all day, everything. It's an all day, every day kind of um, mentality to be prepared and, and to improve resiliency versus, you know, getting the ducks in a row and making sure that people have their maps for, for the what if. Fantastic. Um, okay, so let's go to, to Sally. Sally, you had a question. Go ahead. Um, more a comment. First, I would say to Andrew that I'm um, having looked at a lot of health systems, um, information systems, Memorial Sloan Kettering does a great job. I mean, the information is there. It's, it's there in a way that's accessible both to the experts and to the patients. Um, and you're right that a, a patient might not understand everything, but there's something reassuring about being able to go onto your portal and see everything that your doctor is seeing, even if you don't understand it you at least are prepared with the questions to, to present to the experts. So I think that's really important. I think what um, Borough President Levine said is really important, which is 
don't overwhelm people with data, but, but give them data that can be easily manipulated. And also just the point that we act, um, you know, I, I'm part of their climate justice working group and giving people data well in advance of a disaster. Because it seems like, I mean, even with things like, we find out that cooling centers are available when there's a heat emergency, not in advance of it. We find out when, you know, when um, places go for floods or when it's flooding. We need the information well in advance so that the networks that we act in other groups are, are looking at building know well in advance of a disaster, not when the disaster is happening, what the escape plans are. And I think that's you know, just the timeliness well in advance of an emergency when people can calmly think about what they might do. I mean, right now, all we have out there is, you know, this is what you would put in the go kit, but you know, where do you go? And I, I don't think people know that or understand that at a time when they can digest the information. Instead, they get it when the emergency is happening and that's way too late. So I guess that's my comment. That's great. No, I think it's an excellent point. And uh, especially given that we're entering into a phase now where there's going to be a higher frequency of these types of events. So having like continuous kind of readiness, right. And to be able to, to, to the point around like drivers of change in, uh, in behavior um, to, to be ready for different types of scenarios, different types of weather events. Like that's, it's a, a mindset kind of shift that we all need to kind of adopt now through this. Uh, we're getting close to the end of the, the time here, but we do have another question from uh, Karina. So over to you, Karina, that'll be our last question. And then um, maybe just a quick few words at the end from our panelists to, to close us off. Over to you, Karina. Yeah, thank you so much for hosting this amazing event. I am a senior in high school in the city, so I was actually wondering where you might see any avenues for youth engagement in this whole thing, perhaps like education so that young people can better understand what's going on and also how to inform ourselves so that once we rise to sort of positions of power, how we can sort of manage all of these effects of climate change. So I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, anyone? Thank you. And I think what we'll do, we'll ask uh, like anybody who wants to, to comment and we'll take uh, comments from all of our panelists on, on that topic and we'll close this off because I think that's that's a key question. So I'm glad you raised it. Thank you. Who wants to go first? I see Andrew, you're nodding your head here. So go ahead. Yeah, I'm nodding and I'm trying to think of the best, the best thing to say. <laughs> I think from a climate and, and weather perspective, I mean, there are there are resources from places such as the National Weather Service. Um, for our high schoolers, if you're interested in more of getting involved, like from a career perspective on the climate side, there are many jobs opening up, um, and especially in this kind of intermediate space, you know, of intersection of science, policy, and practice. How do you tailor the forecast? How do you translate the forecast into action? How do you translate the opposite direction as well? How do you translate the data from the communities into a way that scientists could understand? Um, these are jobs that are going to become more popular in higher demand and I'm already seeing it so I guess that's from a scientist perspective I think I'll I think I'll leave it there great um Annie do you want to jump in yeah I can just say this idea this came up in conversations with with members um of having an you know emergency preparedness curriculum in in schools that you know this should this unfortunately is a new reality and and the more that we are talking about emergency preparedness, the more prepared we are. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to follow up with you and maybe we can talk about, you know, having an emergency preparedness day at your school. Like, I think that any of that helps. Oh, that sounds awesome. Thank you so much. It does sound awesome. <laughs> That's great. Eunice, over to you. Yeah, I think, you know, at our office, we constantly think how we can make sure students are part of the solution. It's, you know, their future ultimately, um, and also, like, if you think about students, they're like at the center of like these amazing networks, their peers, their teachers, their neighborhoods and communities. If you live in like a multi generational household, you also have grandma. So I think really viewing students as like, yeah, this this um, anchor to like so many different networks um, and being part of the solution. And I would say, you know, just giving a specific example of like FloodNet. We have been talking to DOE, for example, what would it mean to train and like professional development for teachers to be able to have a program where they can 
help students install these sensors and install them at their schools and then understanding how is flooding impacting maybe student attendance at the school. Um, so really just like, again, making students like part of the solution um, and help, helping them install and track this data. Uh, so again, just being part of the solution and really trying to figure out, um, yeah, how to tap into, I think, which has been incredible youth like excitement, energy and passion around climate change, um, especially here in New York City. Um, and how to, yeah, um, help channel that. That's great. Mark, over to you. Well, this has been uh, a, a great discussion from start to finish. I think that data literacy should be part of the curriculum now, standard curriculum, not just for climate, but this is a world awash in data. And to, to navigate this world successfully, you need to be able to understand that data. I think we saw in the public health crisis of the past two years, um, the failure of uh, our country to adequately educate on how to read data. And uh, it resulted in enormous misuse and abuse of data throughout this crisis, continuing through to today. Uh, it could have been avoided if, if more people uh, understood um, some basic facts, how to, how to access data, where to access data, how to interpret data. Uh, it, it's... Um, it's critical that we provide young people these tools, whether the issue is climate or public health or any other, other aspect of modern society. So I think we might be on to something here. Uh, let, let's, uh, let, let's work together on that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Unis, uh, Andrew, Annie, and Mark. Uh, and thank you for everybody who joined us today. I think this was a really uh, insightful uh, conversation. So thank you for everybody for making the time. Okay, take care. Thank you all.